Hi, I'm Doug Draper with Acme Distribution and the Denver Transportation Club, and I am pleased to present our series, Supply Chain and Logistics, the Storytellers. Uh, the series is brought to you by Cap Logistics. Cap Logistics are experts offering you customized transportation solutions for every need. So please visit caplogistics.com today. So uh, today's uh, topic is uh, something I'm very interested in. It's going to talk about the, the rail system across the country. So we'll kind of say it's uh, who are the key connectors, and then we're going to talk a little bit about precision railroading. Uh, before we jump into it, I, I wanted to uh, introduce our guest. Uh, today we have Doug Thompson. He's the Vice President of Corporate Accounts at the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad. And Doug's joining us from uh, from Dallas, Texas today. So, Doug, welcome. Um, thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to speaking. Yeah, it's you. great. So we like to learn a little bit about our storyteller. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, spend a, a minute or so and talk about yourself, kind of how you got in the industry, and, and obviously tell us a little bit about uh, Genesee and Wyoming and, and your role in the supply chain. So, um yeah, great. So thanks. Um, Doug Thompson, Genesee and Wyoming, like you said, vice president of corporate accounts, been in the rail industry for 25 years. Um, 20 of those years were with Norfolk Southern, an Eastern class one carrier. I've been over at GNW for five years in this corporate account role. Um, GNW brought me over five years ago when they acquired um, Rail America, they doubled in size. They went from 66 railroads to 101. We had always gone to market kind of railroad by railroad. We have salespeople assigned to their railroad, and they do an excellent job working with their local customers. But we weren't going out corporately to headquarters and um, talking to decision makers about our railroad all over the country, our railroads all over the country, where we have 114 in North America, and um, we're in 41 states. So it's a business development role where I'm seeing what new opportunities I can work on and fit into customer supply chains. That's so true. It's That's great. Done really well. Yeah, and a little bit got into the rail industry from Roanoke, Virginia. Um, that has traditionally been a large. Um, Rail is a large employer with Norfolk Southern and Roanoke, so uh, put my resume in there. They hired me and been doing it ever since. That's great. That's good. Hey, w one thing, being out here in Colorado and, and the name, uh, the Genesee in Wyoming, when you and I first met, um, you know, I figured that Wyoming was a significant part of your business. So give us a quick quick snippet of where the name came from, if you don't mind. Sure. So, um like I said, Genesee and Wyoming now, we're 120 railroads worldwide, 114 in, in North America, but Genesee and Wyoming, original, um, the original railroad um, dates back to 1899, and it served a salt mine in Livingston County, New York. There are um, two counties in New York that are Genesee and Wyoming, that's where the name comes, but interestingly enough, we've never had rail service in either one of those counties. Mm. So it's close, but it's not there. So that's the genesis of the name. Gotcha. So a lot of people think it's Wyoming, the state. Um, yep, exactly. Well, thanks for explaining that. So that's terrific. So for our audience, I, I know it's summertime, but we're going to go back to school here a little bit. we got summer school going on, and, and, and part of the conversation is to really – understand all the different connectors and the companies that are involved that complete the rail supply chain. So I think what we should start with is talk about some of those connectors, because most of the folks see uh, Norfolk Southern or out here uh, in Colorado, a lot of BNSF um, trains out there. So maybe we could start with talking about what is a class one railroad and what a short line railroad is, and maybe just kind of give us a brief overview so we can set the stage according, uh, appropriately. Yeah, sure. So um, class ones, class one railroads are um, a network. When you look at it, it's a network of railroads that have been aggregated over time. Um, so in the east, you have uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad in the east is a class one. CSX is a class one railroad in the east 
And then in Canada, you have the Canadian Pacific, the Canadian National. Um, the Canadian National at one point bought the Illinois Central, so they kind of form like a T where they go east to west in Canada, but also run down to uh, the Gulf Coast in Louisiana. So they form a T that way. CP in Canada, like I said, and then um, you have the class ones out west, which is BNSF and UP. Um, there's major interchange points where they they interchange traffic together, and really to customers within those networks, it's pretty seamless. Where if you had a coal that originated in Wyoming and was going to go down to um, a power plant in Georgia, that would move BN and NS, and it would interchange, like let's say Memphis, but to the customer, it's pretty pretty seamless in billing and um, reporting of information. Excellent. All of that. Gotcha. And so there's major interchanges, like a Chicago and Memphis and New Orleans, a St. Louis, where the Western carriers um, interchange with the Eastern carriers, and also Canadian carriers with um, their counterparts. Right. And they're just swapping equipment. There's no transloading, right? They're just moving, hey, here's a rail car of, of coal. They're not unloading the coal and putting it on a Norfolk Southern uh, piece of equipment. They just share the assets as they move them through the network. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So they're interchanging the equipment, and so they're handing the And they do a lot of other things for each other, like they'll pre-block, where the UP knows that that um, block of cars is going to go in a certain direction, so they'll try and set up um, a block of cars that might go to Pittsburgh. They'll already they'll kind of help each other out based on agreements of uh, trying to make it a little bit easier on one another when they interchange. But yeah, they're switching out the, um, they're just delivering the loaded rail cars or empty rail cars to each other in instances of unit trains, like of grain or coal or um, intermodal or what have you, they'll actually leave their power on the train, which creates an operational efficiency because you've already done the air brake test, the locomotives there, you don't have to wait for um, NS's locomotive to show up to pull that BN train. So they'll, they'll share their power, their locomotive power to make it for a more um, efficient total um, time. Interesting. So they would just, the uh, conductors, if you will, you're just swapping out humans. You're not moving equipment. Correct. So at that point, yeah, they're swapping out um, their personnel. And it, it gets, I guess, a little technical, but um, railroad employees are basically qualified to operate over certain segments of their railroad. Gotcha. Um, so. so let's talk a little bit about the short line. So we got the, the class ones, almost like the highway system, right? But I'm a plant that's... That's you know, correct. In, in kind of a, a rural area. So how does it mm -hmm. get from that mainline highway to the, the final place? From my understanding, that's really what the short line's involved with. Yeah, so in a lot of ways, we're an extension of the Class 1 railroad. Um, we're that first mile or last mile or, you know, first 50 miles, last 50 miles of um, rail. So we have that... Um, close relationship with um, shippers and receivers in that way. Um, we really, most all of our business is um, interchange, originates or terminates. The, you know, 91% of that business is with a class one railroad. So really we're, we're partners in the supply chain and the rail supply chain. We, um, really can't do anything without our class one partners and they rely on us quite a bit because a lot of this information is off the American short line association website, but 25, one out of five cars that moves in the uh, North American rail network or the U S rail network, one out of five um, either terminates or originates on a short line. Mm. So um, we're, we're very involved in, you know, the rail transportation network of the country. Right. 
So it, did the short lines uh, come to fruition because the class ones just didn't want to deal with that final mile because it was too complicated or managing uh, assets or infrastructure? So, so I guess the question is why wouldn't the class one just to go ahead and take it all the way to the customer's door, so to speak? Yeah, so I think the, it falls in different buckets. I mean, like our railroad in 1899, um, when you look back that far, it the rail network of class ones wasn't as aggregated. The, like if you look at Norfolk Southern, it goes back to like 1827. They're a conglomerate or they've, Hundred more than a hundred railroads makes up what NS is today, and they formed a network because it's all interconnected. So you might have railroads that date back from quite a long time ago that were never acquired by one of the um, what become one of the Class One railroads. Then you have other ones that were um, a spinoff from a Class One. I kind of sometimes look at the Class Ones like the human body, where they have arteries and major veins, but maybe based on some um, situation they preferred um, to have um, another of their line segments just dedicated or spun off or let somebody else do that, um, going 20 miles down to the paper mill or the coal mine or what have you. So they found that it was more efficient that they just operate within their um, um, really important corridors, lanes, and have short lines um, handle those less dense locations. Then you have areas like where you're at a port of those 114 railroads that we own or operate. A lot of those are at ports. And um, in that case, you have several different railroads going to the port of Corpus Christi or the port of Savannah. So it's nice to have almost like what's a short line railroad or an industrial switching operation that's working with all the class ones and kind of being that neutral party, that Switzerland that mm -hmm. works with everybody. And then some of like our railroad in San Diego, it's owned by the city of San Diego. It's the trolley line during the day moving people. And then at night we're the freight railroad. So some of those you're working with, uh, and some of that goes on in a location like Dallas with our DGNO railroad, where our DART D Dallas area rapid transit um, owns a lot of the line segments, and where the freight operations um, in between when the uh, when the passenger rail is running. Gotcha. That that's a great um, transition to one of the. Uh, uh, really, two questions. Uh, one would be, uh, who pays for all of this infrastructure, right? I mean, you got track and switches and all that kind of stuff. So is the short line responsible to maintain their rail? Uh, is it shared? Is there a whole third party that comes in and maintains the class ones and the short lines? Who's responsible for ensuring it's up and running? Yeah, it's a great question. So when you look just at railroads in general, um, that when you're looking at the railroad, the locomotive, the bridges, the tunnels, all of that was, all that's being maintained. I don't have the percentage, I'll just say the high percentage. All of that's being maintained, built by the railroad. You don't have a lot of government subsidies. Um, within the rail industry as far as, um, you know, like and it's not to really like give trucking a hard time or anything, but really their network is the highway system and that's supported by, you know, state, state, local, federal governments. For us, we're investing in that track, in those bridges, and um, railroads are heavily capital intensive businesses. And um, that goes for the short line industry, but also for the class ones. Got it. Um, terrific. So on, on the, the infrastructure piece of it, last question I have related to that. So um, where does the revenue come from to, to pay for all these assets? Is it like a fixed percent, 15 percent of the revenue we generate goes to infrastructure maintenance? Is it varied yeah, by it is. area? Or tell me about that. Yeah, so it is. 
it it can vary based on um, if it it's in that high teens, uh, just like is it 15, 16, 18 percent? A lot of times it depends on um, how the economy is going. Are you adding capacity or are you maintaining um, just the infrastructure you have? Most of that. Um, capital spend is in maintaining um, just the rail assets that you have, investing in, in maintaining your locomotives, maintaining your bridges, maintaining the track infrastructure. Um, but it kind of varies from year to year, but it is in that high teen percentage, 15, 16, 17, gotcha. 18%. Good deal. So um, shifting gears a little bit, we've talked um, kind of about the infrastructure and the class ones and, and the short lines. Let's talk about the volume that's on these tracks right now. Um, I know our roads are congested. We're always challenged with uh, maintaining, maintaining that infrastructure. And oftentimes you hear, oh, put it on the rail. You know, you'll save a few bucks. It may take a little bit longer, but put it on the rail. It's a good deal. Well, so many people say put it on the rail. There's only so many tracks, and obviously you're spending – 15, 16% to maintain those tracks. It's not like you can add another lane. Um, so talk about all of the increased volume on the intermodal side, whether that's ocean container business that's coming in, whether it's uh, over the road carriers putting actually, you know, 53 foot trailers on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the tracks. How are you guys dealing with the infrastructure with, put it on the rail, they got plenty of capacity. Yeah, so, um... I think railroads are always, and you. I think we all see it in our business, that we're always asking and our customers for information on what they're forecasting for the future, what their trends are. I think um, railroads do a good job of understanding markets as best they can to understand um, what is the growth going to be when you cited like intermodal traffic and is that international intermodal traffic or is it growth in domestic intermodal because um, with driver shortages or just lifestyle um, I think that over the road trucking it's harder to find that employee that wants to go from Virginia to California so how can railroads and trucking companies work together on um, domestic intermodal where um, the trucking company does that 10 to 15 percent on the origin and 10 percent of the work on the destination and railroads help um, move the containers in between so it's it's really trying to get that forecast information um, there there is capacity on railroads but a lot of times there's choke points too and I think it's under it's important for um, transportation the rail transportation groups, but just transportation folks in general, when they're turning on, I would say significant new lanes of traffic, that they really want to understand that rail operations as best they can to make sure the capacity is there or is going to be there, or what are the plans um, for the future. And um, an example, G and W, we interchange um, 1.6 million car loads with class ones annually. Um, in our case, as short lines, we, um, we're an entrepreneurial group where we do have that um, local operations team. We have our local sales team that can work to understand customers' business to, uh, to grow with them and that connectivity, that's been very successful for us, just being able to have that local communication where maybe a lot of times with class one, it's, it's more from a corporate headquarters and it's, it's harder to be in tune right. um, with your customer. Yeah, well, for, forecasting and planning and understanding what your clients are doing obviously is, is key, which leads us into uh, a topic we wanted to, to follow up on the second half of this show and uh, for a few minutes talk about the concept of precision railroading. Uh, it's all, also referred to as, as PSR. Um, tell us what does that mean and how is that unique? And I, I've heard that buzz term uh, recently. So what is precision railroading? 
Yeah, um, you know, people argue or can or you read it in magazines. I don't think we sit around and argue about it, but people talk in magazines about, you know, what is it? Is it new? A lot of ways it's trying to operate to a schedule, maximize your assets of locomotive power, crews and capacity. So I don't know that that's ever been. I think that's always been a goal of railroad operations is. To do those things, but I, I think maybe sometimes it gets away from like everything has to go to a classification yard or a hump yard, and how can you find um, maybe flat switch cars um, somewhere where you haven't traditionally um, reclassified cars to go from an origin to destination. Sometimes I look at it maybe as a, uh, a Southwest Airlines versus a um, United Airlines, where United has those fixed hubs, you know you're always going to go through Houston, Chicago, New York, where Southwest is willing to have uh, passengers, um, you know, hop on another flight in a non-traditional hub like a a Nashville or a St. Louis. So I think Precision Railroad Railroad in kind of doesn't force everything to go through certain classification yards or hump yards. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great analogy on the, on the airlines. Everybody can, can grasp that. Uh, and like you said, precision railroading, the more efficient that is, will increase the capacity out there in, in the entire network. So that's uh, it's a good summary. Thank you for that. What, uh, in, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, talk about some future trends, uh, whether that would be uh, technology advancements or maybe even a g- more general question is where do you see the railroad, you know, five, ten years out? Yeah, so I think um, future trends is probably looking to see how much of the precision railroading ideas and models stick um, and how much they're ingrained long term. I think that's something to look for. I mean, I also always encourage customers, not just so they'll talk to me as a sales guy, but just to the railroads in general. You know, PSR or other things railroads do, and all industries go through transitions and applying new ideas, that it can cause frustration for a customer. But, you know, don't, I think that's a time to increase communication and learning and trying to see a direction where your supply chain partners going instead of becoming frustrated and and shutting down. And I've seen customers go both ways with that. So I think that they um, it'd be really good to just um, focus as much as you can to understanding what direction um, your rail carrier is going that serves um, you know serves your plant. And then future trends, I do think that more and more just the technology of how information is reported, is does it become more handheld where people can know through an app or something like that where their, where their cars are, how can, they, um, how can they know if they're on the right track or wrong track with their service, things like that. I think railroads do behind the scenes – tremendous, especially the class ones, tremendous investment in technology on, um, you know, for safety and things. Right. I think you'll see more and more technology integrated into what's been a very um, traditional um, old economy industry. Yeah. Well, the the Internet of Things that we've talked about before and the visibility, um, you know, give the client visibility and they can respond accordingly. So it's good to know that the the rails are embracing that as well. So, Doug, the, the, our time always goes by faster than, than, than we expect, but we've been talking to uh, Doug Thompson with the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad. And, and Doug, thank you so much for uh, a quick lesson here in, in the summertime. It's uh, great to have you on the show. So thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. And thank all of you for joining us today on uh, the Connect and Collaborate Network featuring supply chain and logistics the storytellers, obviously brought to you by Cap Logistics. So again, please visit them at caplogistics.com.